Here we go. Welcome, Sam. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for accepting my invitation. It's such an honor. I feel thank like you. you are this ghost that has been inhabiting my mind for so long that you have become an introject in my life. <laughs> yeah, all right. This sounds like this sounds like demon demon possession. <laughs> In this case, it's a good possession. Right. So um, I really want to thank you for joining me. I'm starting a new uh, video uh, podcast series, and I decided to launch it with you. It's called Aspire to Inspire, and I'm going to be conducting interviews with, with prominent figures who are very well respected in their own field, but I'm going to be covering very different subjects. So you are the psychologist, and I will be covering music and writers, historians, oh, yes. so... Well, um, if it's if it's with prominent figures who are well known <laughs> in, in their field, then we should we should uh, we should uh, stop the recording. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't no. qualify. I even adore your self-deprecation. You know, it's uh, it's quite endearing. It's ostentatious, ostentatious <laughs> self-deprecation. <laughs> well, it's endearing, and it comes with a wonderful sense of humor. So I I appreciate that very much. Um, I really want to really approach it more from a scholarly per perspective so you don't have to simplify anything because the, my audience is going to be very smart people. Um, and that it's uh, actually very important for me that you come from that perspective because that's really what brought me to your to your work. Um, you know, I've been in talk therapy since I was 15 years old and it sort of functioned only as a Band-Aid. You know, I always needed to intellectually uh, connect with something before I could modify any behavior in myself. And so self-help, all of that never really worked for me. And a good friend of mine who's a psychologist introduced me to your work. And I bought your book uh, without see, hearing any of your lectures. And I took it on an airplane with me. And um, I, I, I couldn't put the book down. I just didn't put it down. And I decided when probably, I arrived... Probably the price. <laughs> I bought a highlighter. I, I should have brought it here to show right. you and make you laugh. I bought a highlighter and started highlighting the sections that I felt were important. And then once I got a chapter in, my son made a joke. He said, you do realize you're highlighting the whole book, right? <laughs> and so I decided had to... I been, had, I been modest, had I been modest, <laughs> I would have blushed. But... Uh, okay, well, you're going to get plenty of narcissistic supply in this interview. Right. Way to go, way to go. <laughs> and me, uh, as a disclaimer... As a disclaimer, I want to say that if at, at any point in this interview I sound intelligent on the subject, it has nothing to do with me. It all has to do with listening to your lectures, reading your book, Thank and you. um, my God, it's so it's it's just so impressive how you can communicate. Your command of language is is just you know it's something I personally appreciate a lot, and you have this incredible capacity to just take. Thank you. I think, I think people would appreciate if we transition from <laughs> narcissistic supply to yes. narcissism. <laughs> okay, yeah. so thank you. You're going to have to keep me focused a lot during this interview. So I'm going to just do a short introduction um, because I know you hate that part of it. Um, so for those of you who unfortunately don't know who Sam Vaknin is, Sam Vaknin is a writer, professor of psychology, and an expert on narcissistic personality disorder. He is the author of the book, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, a must-have. And uh, we're not going to dive into any of Sam's personal history for the sake of focusing on his lifelong work and research. But uh, for the sake of context, I will just state that Sam has lived a very tumultuous and illustrious, colorful life um, during which he was twice diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, which led him to embark upon the journey of introspection in order to understand what had happened to him and to be able to describe his findings. This led to his studies first into pathology, cluster B, and eventually into NPD. Unfortunately, at that time in the mid nineties, no literature existed on the topic. So he had to create a completely new language to describe the internal landscape and experience of a narcissist. In 1995, Sam launched the first website on narcissistic personality disorder when absolutely nothing existed on the topic and he is responsible for most of the terminology that is used today. 
Sam also created the very first website on narcissism and ran many of the first support groups created to treat narcissistic abuse. All of it them. Is very, <laughs> it, it is very important to note, this part is important, that unlike much of the information that is found on this subject on the internet, which is propagated by life coaches, gurus, and so-called experts, Sam's findings are based on actual data collected from decades of research and studies, actual studies. So is there anything I've left out? I mean, you have such a well, distinct... Only, the, my, my compliments, you've encapsulated me. Um, <laughs> well, the, the only correction a... is that I'm a former, former professor of psychology. I, I retired well, last year. Oh, to, uh, to, to our dismay. <laughs> Well, yeah, actually, you're even you're a physicist. You you um, I oh. left out that part if people want to know. But you 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 really are also a genius. If I'm not mistaken, you have a 190 IQ. Is that is that correct? Between 180 and 190, depending on the test. I've been tested three times. Yes. Well, you attended a university at nine years old, so we can just say I you do. have a very high IQ. So um, now to just dive right in, um, I. I want to begin with something personal uh, for me because beyond your scholarly achievements, you know, I, I personally find you to be more of a philosopher and even, a, I dare say, a poet. Um, you have such a prosaic approach to this subject and you're so eloquent in being able to draw such a wide and intricate arch between the corporeal and the non-temporal realms. Um, so I want to just begin with this quote and then I'm going to ask you this question. It's, it's such a beautiful way that you describe uh, psychology. You say human psychodynamics, ca psychodynamics cannot be essentialized into molecules. Therefore, psychology is a literary enterprise, not a science, because it deals with raw materials that cannot be captured through scientific methods. That if we wish to understand narcissism and psychopathy, we should seek it in writings of Goethe, Freud, and Dostoevsky, whom you described as being the greatest chronicler of mental illness. So as a fellow lover of language, literature, and psychology, my first question to you would be, what is your personal correlation between psychology and literature? Psychology is a pseudoscience in the sense that it pretends to be a science. However, the raw material upon which psychology acts, this raw material is human beings. And we have a similar predicament in physics when we try to ascertain the properties of particles we actually end up changing these properties this is known as the uncertainty principle the the entirety of psychology is founded on a massive uncertainty principle people change minute by minute and they get transformed by the very act of being observed. Hmm. They react to the experiment. They interact with the study. They develop personal relationships, however, in the micro, with the scholars, with the researchers, with the laboratory assistants. On the way to the experiment, they've had a mishap that affects their mood, changes their personality to a large extent. Then they're invited the next day to replicate the experiment, yet they are not the same person. Something has happened in the evening. They've been rejected by a woman. They lost all their money, or they made money, or they got drunk, or they had a fight with a neighbor, or whatever. It is not possible to fixate human beings the way we fixate butterflies or, or the sun, Human beings are protean. They are mutable, not immutable. And so psychology has serious problems, faces serious problems when it, when it attempts to be an exact science. It undergenerates hypotheses. It fails to ascertain the identity of its subjects over time, over space. It has to resort to florid, florid texts <laughs> in order to capture the essence mm. of even the most rudimentary observations. And 
it is compelled to deal with appearances rather than with substance because psychology relies almost exclusively on self-reporting. Yes. This is also a major problem with psychological testing. For example, the major tests for psychopathy and for narcissism rely on honest self-reporting, which I find hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is called in philosophy the intersubjectivity problem. We have no privileged access to another person's mind. We cannot measure it. We cannot learn anything about it. We rely 100% of another person's self-reporting, either behaviorally or verbally. So we monitor another person's behavior, or we ask a question, and then the output, or the input in our case, determines a series of assumptions and theories and hypotheses as to what may be happening. <laughs> but we have no way, for example, to decide whether we are real human beings or perhaps androids from the future. We have no way to, to ascertain that your emotions are my emotions. So when you say I'm sad, I have no way to determine whether you're sad the way I'm sad. Even when you say this color is red, I have no way to prove rigorously that your color red is my color red. Daltonists, for example, have this problem. And so the intersubjectivity problem obstructs any meaningful communication and discourse in psychology. Mm. Because we make far-fetched assumptions as to the identity of subjects based exclusively on their external appearance. The only reason I assume that you're a human being is because you have two hands and two legs, I, I think. I haven't seen, but I assume you have two legs and two hands. And you definitely have a head. And you smile. And this scattershot set of, set of phenomena tells me that you are a human being, that you're like me. But of course, this is nonsense. Complete nonsense. Therefore, psychology can never be a science. What is it therefore? It's a form of literature. It is structured literature. It is pseudo-scientific literature in the sense that it appropriates the language of science. Sometimes, by the way, it's beautiful literature. Freud's writings are, can compete easily with, with any author in the 20th century. He should have won the Nobel Prize for Literature, I fully believe. And so... It's literature, simply. It is a set of insights embedded in the human assumption of commonality and what we call empathy, which is a topic for another, perhaps, interview. And that's just about it. In this sense, Freud is equal to Dostoevsky, and Dostoevsky is equal to Skinner, and Skinner is definitely, and Skinner and Dostoevsky and Freud are definitely superior to any practicing psychologist nowadays, because practicing, practicing psychologists nowadays are trying to reduce the human phenomenon to mathematics, to laboratory procedures, to substances, and, yes. and to brain activity. This reductionism is counterfactual. And it is scientifically not uh, uh, scientifically and philosophically not rigorous. Mm. 